Well, firstly, thank you, Alex, for putting on this fantastic show. It is a wonderful, isn't it? Amazing show. And invited all these people. So um, <clears throat> Alex gave me the title, which was uh, Compassion and Courage, which I'm going to <clears throat> excuse me, talk about today. Um, a thought for you, though. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. Because I had a dog that used to like to chase people on bikes. Well, in the end, I had to take the bikes off him. <laughs> All right. So why, why compassion then? We need compassion because life is very hard. We, we, we don't want to see you like this after the conference. But what's interesting, I think, is that over the last 20 years, there's been an understanding that we need to move forward in our uh, thinking about consciousness and a whole range of what goes on in the mind. And of course, for 3,000 years, this is, and more, this has been part of contemplative traditions where you get to understand the mind by becoming an observer of your own mind. And then, of course, we have the Western science, which is relatively quite new, two to 300 years old, perhaps, or so you could go back to the Greeks, maybe. But generally speaking, this is to study things from the outside, to do replications and scientific studies and so forth. And both of these uh, groups now, uh, the scientists and the com contemplative folk, are coming together to study things like compassion, pro-social behavior, and the Dalai Lama was very instrumental in this, in linking up with a number of Western uh, scientists and formed the Mind and Life organization, which is an amazing organization. For me, I was lucky enough to uh, be associated with a place called Sami Ling, and we have some people from Sami Ling sitting right there, the Mindfulness Association, and they've got a stand out in the arena there. As you can see, there I am, look right at the back there, so it's just sitting there. <laughs> <coughs> And this was the throne room, and if you go there, you can go and do um, meditations. You can do uh, Chesresne meditations at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, where they bang the drums and they sing in deep voices. It's great. It's cold, though, particularly in the winter. <laughs> and I had the opportunity to spend some time listening to the Dalai Lama. And we, in Australia, we had a discussion about compassion for the dark side. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today, that compassion is all very well for happiness and so on and so on. But actually, the most important part, the most courageous part of compassion is compassion for the dark side. So what is compassion then? Well, compassion um, is a motivation. And it's important to realize that all motivations have two elements to them, a stimulus detection and a response. So if you're eating, think of eating, the motivation to eat, then you have to be able to identify food. And when you see food, that stimulates you. But then you need to know what to do. So if you're a gorilla, you need to know how to peel bananas. If you're a lion and you see an antelope, you need to know, I need to chase that, hunt it, and kill it. There's no point in being very hungry, seeing the antelope, and thinking, that's food. So now what do I do? I haven't got a clue. You need to know what to do. If you watch the pigeons, because it's the, that time of the year where there's sexual behavior going on, you know, and you watch the pigeons, they have their dance, don't they? They cluck around like this. This is what they do in order to form courtships. Well, I've tried that with my wife. It does absolutely nothing. Yeah. So this is important because we're going to see there are two basic psychologies to compassion then. And understanding this is quite important because there's a lot of discussion about psychology, uh, compassion as an emotion and so forth. In the Buddhist traditions, compassion is very much about motivation. So in our book, Mindful Compassion, that I wrote with Chodin, we settled on a definition of Compassion is a sensitivity to suffering and distress in self and others with a commitment to try to relieve and prevent it. And we added in this idea about compassion also has to be about the prevention of suffering. So you have two psychologies then, one which is linked to um, the ability to approach, to turn to, into compassion. This is called the courageous element, because if you're going to turn towards suffering, it can be tricky. And then the second element of compassion is the preparedness to dedicate yourself to the wisdom to finding what to do. So if you want to be a psychologist or a nurse or a doctor, uh, being prepared to engage with suffering and make yourself vulnerable to diseases and so forth, that's great, but it's not very useful if you don't study very much and you don't know what you're doing. So within the Buddhist traditions, these two things are very important, turning towards, but then developing the competencies to know what to do. There are two other elements to it, uh, which gives rise to this. And this is called bodhicitta in the Buddhist traditions, or bodhisattva. 
And part of it is not only may you become enlightened to enlighten others, but also you develop an identity, a sense of self that is committed to not carelessly or purposely cause suffering, harm and suffering. Now that's important because we're working with businesses and we're trying to get businesses to identify this is a moral value, that your business should not carelessly or purposely cause suffering. And then it leads to the other thing called the golden rule. So when we think about courage, then think about the doctors that went off to the Ebola crisis. And many people who went to save others had to work with their own threat systems. They had to override their own anxieties about getting the virus and so forth. So it, the key thing here is courage. You would not call this kindness. You wouldn't say, oh, how kind these people are going to. You call them a compassionate act. For those of you who are religious, when you think about Christ, you don't say the kindness of Christ. You say the compassion of Christ. And we've just done a study to show that kindness and compassion are quite different. People use the word kindness when they're talking about doing nice things like remembering birthdays. But when it comes to doing things that alleviate suffering, people use the concept of <coughs> compassion. So it's the same with you. If you're going to be compassionate to your own pain, it's developing the courage to engage with the things that are causing you pain. Now, this is going to be important when I get on to the, the issue of the dark side. So there are two aspects to compassion action. One is communal, the ability to be uh, kind. That is an important quality of compassion. It's different to compassion. So if you're sitting with somebody who is um, distressed or dying, then this will be a soothing, calming function. But you also need an, an, an energetic agent aspect of compassion, the act of doing. So if you're fighting injustice, then you are uh, engaged in action. You're activated. If you're saving a child in a burning house, uh, you're not... <laughs> You're not walking into the house in a sort of soothed state. Here I go. I'm going to walk into this house to save this child. I'm in a compassionate state of mind. My heart is pure. My heart is open. <laughs> no, no, you're anxious, right? So compassion can't possibly be an emotion because the emotion depends upon the context. If you're fighting injustice, it's anger. If you're saving somebody, that's under threat, it could be anxiety. And the ability to regulate those emotions is what makes compassion. The ability to regulate those emotions. So if I can't regulate my fear, then I don't go into the house. So this means that we can see compassion is linked to an engaging function, an action function, and a self-identity. And all of that goes to making compassionate mind. We also know that the compassion can be seen as a flow. So there's the compassion that I have for you, compassion people have for me. And there's also the compassion one can have for oneself. Now, this is important because when you're working clinically with many of our clients, they may not have received much care and compassion from early in their life. And as a result of that, they struggle with accepting compassion from others. So they live in a very isolated world where they don't feel other people care about them. And they don't have much self-compassion either. So it's a pretty barren world. So a lot of our therapy is designed not only for self-compassion, but also to improve people's ability to be compassionate and to be open and gr have gratitude for their compassion from others. So that's important. So th there are confusions then. So is compassion just about being nice? Because when you talk to business people, they think compassion is fine, but it's just a little bit of kindness, a bit of niceness, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not that. Is it just about taking pain away? No, it's not that, because sometimes it's not possible to do that. Is it submitting then and just doing what other people want? No, it's not that, because you can't be compassionate from a submissive or a weak position, because that's not it, compassion, that's submissiveness. Being kind to people because you, you want them to like you that's not true compassion. It's compassion about love. Now, if you really want to drive me nuts, talk about <laughs> compassion as love. You know, you've got, to, you've got to love people. So everybody knows, I think you will be a sophisticated audience, that meta doesn't actually mean love. Loving kindness is actually a tragic translation of meta. Meta means open-heartedness. Meta means non-malevolent intent. It means benevolent intent. So think of all of those doctors treating the people with the Ebola virus, right, they had benevolent intent to help them for their suffering, right? They didn't need to love them. 
Okay, there's no, you don't need to love the people that you, you may never want to see them again. And we do a meditation where you can practice uh, having uh, benevolent feelings for people you don't like. You may never want to see them, but the whole issue of benevolence is to deal with our underlying potential for benevolence, malevolence. So <clears throat> when we do this, particularly with our clients, it's a great relief because they often didn't realize uh, that they can be compassionate and still dislike people. Yes, you can. Okay, it's, it's, it's not that. So creating the conditions for building the courage and the wisdom and dedication to face what we need to face to aspire to be the best. So it's the courage to face the things in ourselves that will allow us to grow and to be at our best. And this is guided by the concern for the well-being of ourselves and others and our impact upon them. And therefore, compassion must involve ethics as well. So here are some of the... I won't go into all of them because I don't have the time. But here are some of the things that are what we call facilitators and inhibitors. <laughs> Every motivation has these same dimensions. So it's easier to be compassionate to people you like than people you don't. It's easier to receive compassion from people you like than people you don't. It's easier to have sex with people you like than people you don't. It's easier to have a meal with people you like than people you don't. I mean, whatever. Liking turns out to be a massive dimension for all motors. And this is important because compassion is the ability, the courage of compassion is the ability to override the tendency to withhold compassion to people you don't like. Okay, this is really important. Competence, if you know what you're doing, if you think people deserve it, being empathic rather than non-empathic. Non-empathic people may want to be compassionate, but they often are not particularly compassionate. So there's a whole range of them here. So the point is that there are things that make compassion easy and things that make compassion difficult. So we can see compassion then in terms of this motivation to aspire to address suffering in others and certainly not to cause it. But the dark side of humanity is unfortunately very dominant and has been dominant in the world for the last 3,000 years, particularly driven by a lot of aggressive male leaders. You can go back to the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Roman emperors, Hitler, Stalin, loads of them, hundreds of them, right, that have dominated this. And what they do is they create the dark side of humanity, an insensitivity, I don't know why that's there, an insensitivity to suffering the self and others, and a careless or even purposeful wish to create it. Now, we've got leaders in the world right now who are frankly callous. This is callousness. Callousness is the turning off of compassion. I don't care how much suffering I cause you in me pursuing my own goals. That is absolute callousness. It's not cruelty in the sense that they enjoy the suffering. It is the insensitivity. So compassion the opposite of compassion is callousness. So why do we suffer? Let's have a think about that. So compassion is one of the processes that looks into the deep areas of uh, suffering. Why do we suffering? So it's not just about trying to prevent it. We also need to understand it. And of course, for those of you who follow the evolutionary model, we are up here. We're part of the evolved life process. And we have this chap called... Uh, Darwin, Charles Robert Darwin, um, who pointed out that we are biological forms that have been created and have been changed through natural uh, selection. So the po this is important because what it means, and this is a, this is a mindfulness practice actually in our, in our tradition, as Heather knows and Hannah's up the back there, as you know, uh, DNA carries information for building bodies, minds, to carry them around. So basically your DNA is an information, it's a building machine. It's, it builds organisms. It builds organisms into rats or monkeys or elephants or humans. And what is passed on is information to build out of inorganic, out of atoms and molecules. How do you build an elephant? How do you build a human? Bodies are short-lived, subject to disease, injury and predation. And pain is built into the design because pain is the organism's way of understanding something has gone wrong. Now, what's really interesting is that we now know that genes can be turned on and off. Genes for compassion, genes for altruism can be turned on and off. 
Okay, you can't change the genome, but you can change the genetic expression. There are tags on genes, methylated tags on genes. And if you grow up in a violent environment, then your gen genes that are turned on, the pattern of your genetic expressions will be very different than if you grow up in a non-environment violent environment. So that means that we are all gene built uh, with evolved bodies and brains that are designed to do certain things. Your brain has been built for you, not by you. This is, in, with the concept of the illusion of the self, right, the illusion of the self, this is the illusion. This is the illusion. The illusion that you and what you feel and what you do is something about you. Well, actually, no, because you've been built. You are simply a built organism. That's what you are. And you have been built to do certain things. You have a capacity for anger, anxiety, rage, vengeance, and all the rest of it. That is not you, right? So Matthew Ricard has a wonderful story. He says, look, your mind is like a, 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 um, water. It can contain a poison or a medicine. But it, water is neither of those things. Your mind is like a spotlight. It can shine on many things, but it is not the thing it shines on. And the great illusion of the self is when the light confuses itself with what it shines on. The water thinks it is poison. Now, your content of your mind is created by your biology, by your genes. And they've created you to do one of two things, to survive and reproduce, right? So this is really, really important when you're doing your mindfulness. Just be aware of what you're mindful of. The second thing is we become aware that we're all here for a relatively short time and we have to make the best of it. And also that we are socially created. If I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby into a violent drug gang, this version of poor girl wouldn't exist. I would probably be somebody who'd be quite violent, maybe covered in tattoos. I'm not particularly keen on tattoos. They hurt, you know what I mean? Um, and what's interesting is if there was some way that the two versions could meet each other, they wouldn't even like each other. I would not like that raping, violent drug baron. And this drug baron would think I was a total wimp and a waste of time. So even the versions of me, that neither of which I chose, wouldn't get on, right? What? does it mean then to talk about a self? It's nonsense. There is no self. These are just patterns that are created via your genes, by your biology. But there is something else, of course, which is this whole issue of consciousness. Now that, or what the Buddhists call mind, is the interesting story. And that's why mindfulness becomes so important. So we need to develop the courage to see that the human mind it's potentially tricky, nasty, and dangerous. And one of the things that the Compassionate Mind Foundation is doing quite a lot is to help people understand that, yes, compassion is for kindness and love, blah, blah. I'm all in favor of it. You know, give me a bit of compassionate love. I love it, you know. This is not going to change the world. What is going to change the world is having the honesty to recognize that we are a nasty species. We are a nasty species. We are one of the nastiest species that have ever lived on this planet. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is because we have a whole range of motivational systems that we inherit from other animals. But the other reason is because about two million years ago, we started to get clever. Okay, so we have capacities for self-monitoring, self-criticism, thinking about the future, planning to do things. We can be artists and all that stuff. You'll never see a chimpanzee sitting under a tree taking their pulse going, oh my god, that's so fast, you know. <laughs> I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> or looking into the lake and thinking, god, have I put on weight? I mean, that's just <laughs> terrible, it's terrible. So as far as we know, um, <clears throat> most animals do not have this insight for this capacity for mindfulness. Humans do. But how do they use it? Because, you see, what happens is that we can actually use it in ways that are not terribly helpful. We can use our minds to create the worst possible things in the world, not the best possible things. Take, for example, the way in which our minds can stimulate our physiologies. So, for example, if you're hungry and you see a meal, <clears throat> this will stimulate your emotional brain and make your saliva work. But you could just imagine a meal, just lay in bed and, oh, 
So if you're a meat eater, it would be steak and chips. If you're a vegetarian, it would be a stuffed pepper. <gasps> oh, a stuffed pepper. I could die for a stuffed pepper. Uh, imagine that you see something erotic on EastEnders or something like that. <laughs> well, that stimulates your pituitary and gives you... But you can just imagine, can't you? You can lay in your bed and just create fantasies. And those fantasies you're creating in your mind on purpose can stimulate a very small set of cells in your brain called your pituitary. You can do that. As far as we know, no animal can do that. No animal can choose to do that. As far as we know, no lion wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what, I've got to get fit? Because those, those zebras, you know, they're just getting too fast. I'm going to do some circuit training. <laughs> You can, because you have a different type of mind, right? You can. So there's another story, isn't there? What's the lightest thing in the world? The male penis, because it can be raised by thought alone. <laughs> now, the other thing is, of course, that if you are being bullied or you're, you have vengeful thoughts or angry thoughts or whatever it is, that is simply going to stimulate your threat system. And if you do it to yourself... And many of the clients that I see are very good at self-critics. If you wanted to hire one, you'd hire one of my patients because they are fantastic. They're brilliant. You know, they're vicious. They really go for it. Uh, but the only thing you're going to be doing is stimulating these brain systems because we have a capacity for stimulating these brain systems. Now, the fact of the matter is that, on the other hand, if you stimulate positive emotion, right, if you stimulate compassion and emotion, there are whole systems of mechanisms in your brain that when you turn those off, they will do you a lot of good. And so, basically, compassionate mind training is training people to stimulate the physiological systems that are actually going to organize their brains in different ways. Okay, I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. So the key thing, then, is to remember that humans have a whole range of physiological, uh, motivational processes to feed, harm avoidance, resource acquisition, and so forth. But we have this new brain called knowing awareness. And this is a very, very special brain in the universe. The problem is, how do we use it? Because for me, right, the dimension that we call spirituality, when you call spirituality, is responsibility. Responsibility. We have woken up. We have a brain that gives us a capacity for knowing awareness. But unfortunately, we don't always use it wisely. Unfortunately, we use this capacity to do terrible harm. If you think of some of the factory farms in America, for example, it is the way we treat animals is just a holocaust. It's ridiculous. Okay? But we had a real holocaust not so long ago. Animals don't have holocausts. I mean, they kill each other. Yes, they f for sure they do, and there's even such a thing as monkey wars, but they don't create the kind of horrible history that we have created. So there you are, you have this, but you also have the potential for some wonderful things too on the green side, right? Think of all the things like torture and slavery and stuff. Think of female genital mutilation. What? Chinese foot binding. Are you crazy? Yes, humans are crazy, right? Compassion is addressing the fact that humans are mostly mad. We are mad. We have created crazy cultures, mad cultures, where so many people in the world are in poverty, are in starvation situations, and so on and so on. We need to wake up to this reality. Compassion is not about walking around with a smile on your face, I'm a kind person. It isn't that. Compassion is the courage to take action to address this terrible condition that humanity has created. So when we look into the brain then, this is the whole point about understanding what your mind is up to because you didn't design the damn thing. It's been designed for you. You didn't design it. Do not claim it as you. It's being designed. And your mind works the same as most other minds in this room because you all got the same design. So this is important. Now, when you become an observer, you're not a neutral, indifferent observer, but one with insight empathy and compassion. You're observing, you're becoming mindful for a reason, okay? Not just to settle your mind and feel better and cope with difficulties, that is true. The Dalai Lama gives a wonderful story. When, when he was young, uh, he used to like to fix wristwatches from his people that would come from uh, various places. And so he was fixing a, a watch one day, French watch, I think it was, and uh, nearly fixed it and dropped a screw into the mechanism. And in that moment of frustration, he took a hammer and smashed the watch. He said, 
which is Tibetan for shit. <laughs> <laughs> then he looked at us and he said, so you see, no more watch. In that moment of mindlessness, I had done exactly the opposite of my true intention. My true intention was to build a beautiful watch, and in that moment, I behaved in such a way that I could not now fulfill that intention. Mindfulness is the vehicle for maintaining attention to intention. Okay, so see, when you're mindful, you're aware that you're being pulled away from your intention. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, the Mahayana tradition, what is the intention? The intention is bodhicitta. The intention is the compassionate identity. I would like to be a person who's able to address <laughs> suffering wisely and certainly not be a person that carelessly or deliberately causes it. Okay? That is my intention. And I choose that intention. And every day I wake up and I focus on that intention. Now I can use mindfulness because I know that mindfulness is to keep me. So when I start to get angry or upset or frustrated or anxious, I can always remember, but my intention is to be a, a compassionate person. OK. So the next thing to remember then is if you're going to do mindfulness, and I think this is where mindfulness needs a little bit of a, a touching up, if I can put it that way. Um, when you get to know your mind, there will be things that you are familiar with and get to know, but there will also be things in your mind that you will not want to know, particularly if you've been traumatized or whatever it is, and there will also be things that you will not want to be mindful of. You may not want to be mindful of your own potential for sadism or whatever. You may not want to go down that road. Now, therapists, to some degree, need to do that, because if they leave everything in the shadow, it's going to be very difficult for them to understand their clients. But it's difficult. It's painful. So when we're being mindful, we're using introspection. But introspection into what? What are you getting to know? This is really important. Are you getting to know something about you? Well, partly so. And you're paying attention with, exception, uh, with acceptance and without judgment. WG is without judgment. Insight. But insight into what? Now, the interesting thing is this. So the hours are. You're getting insight into nature's mind as it operates through you. When you get insight into the, how your rage works, that when your rage mind thinks like this, rage mind wants to lash out and cause harm, and anxiety mind thinks like this, depressed mind thinks like this, sexual mind thinks like this. This is all being built for you. This is all, you didn't design any of that stuff. Okay? And not only that, we could put chemicals into your brain so that you didn't feel it. We can put chemicals into your brain that will block that. So it's all to do with biology, isn't it, really? So this is very important. So it turns out, then, that one of the things that I think is really important in mindfulness and is not in the mindfulness is to realize what Jung said is that you have a collective mind, a mind that you share with everybody else. And this is the mind of shared inherited dispositions, uh, consciousness and unconsciousness. OK, thank you so much. It is the mind that gives you impulses, fantasies, and dreams, the writers of fictions that are universally understood. All right? So sometimes we have clients who come to us and said, say to me, I had the most horrible intrusions. You know, I had this intrusion about doing something really horrible to somebody the other day. I don't know why that was. Partly because they haven't processed their rage. So they're getting int rage intrusions, but they don't want to own them. But if you were Stephen King, you'd say, fantastic, what a wonderful idea. This will make me a fortune. <laughs> you write it down, don't you, right? There's a thing called night terrors, where people have these absolute terrors. Where do they come from? They haven't come from the personal experience. They're from the collective unconscious. There was a study done on cats. It's not a very nice study, but there is a clevo isole, which is a, um, a muscle in the back of your neck, so that when you sleep, it paralyzes you, so you don't act out your dreams. And sometimes people wake up, and that hasn't switched back on, and they can wake up and feel paralyzed. It's a pretty scary condition. But when they did it to the cats, what they found was that when the cats were dreaming, they were walking around as if they were hunting mice. These were laboratory cats. They'd never seen mice. Your mind is full of archetypal potential. 
That's how all of us can write stories, we can have fantasies, you can see things on the television all the time that you've never encountered, you're never likely to encounter, neither have the writers. They fantasize, they make them up. What is the source of that stuff? It's your collective mind. Don't own it, because if you start owning it, you will really get into trouble. And that's sometimes what happens with people who have mindfulness, is that that barrier between the conscious and the unconscious can be a little bit tricky. And so they start getting flooded with rather unpleasant things that they have no understanding of what to do with. There is a personal mind then, which is unique patterning of the archetypal mind. So this is your unique pattern. You'll have a unique pattern. So if I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby, that pattern would be very different to this pattern. And these are points of conscious awareness. So when I'm doing mindfulness then, I'm getting not only mindfulness into my experiences, but I'm getting mindfulness into nature's mind. Okay, so I'm learning to drive this thing. That's what my responsibility is. I didn't design it, I didn't put any of that stuff in there, but I need to learn how to drive it in order to follow my intention such that this brain does not, this mind does not, purposely or carelessly cause suffering. So that brings us then to this, these two things that are so important. How are you going to do this? If your mind is full of all this capacity for wonderful things and terrible things, what are you going to do? Well, the first thing is to learn about it, pay attention to what it's up to, and don't judge yourself because of it. Because you didn't develop it, you didn't put it there. The next thing is become mind aware. Understand, if you're going to be mindful, what are you mindful of? <laughs> what are you looking at? How did it get to be there? Okay, don't be naive. And the third thing, of course, for me, is if you set your compassionate intention, this will really help you. Okay, so I'm going to want to just talk a little bit about compassion for the dark side. And uh, for those of you who are interested in this, this is in the new book called Living Like Crazy, and it's about the way in which we have created some terrible things for each other over the last 3,000 years. You think about the Roman games, you think, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, but we're at the brink now where I think with mindfulness movements and con uh, many other movements are saying, hang on, hang on a minute. We need to wake up with what this thing's doing, you know, because it left to its own devices, it's not always so nice. We need to wake up to thinking about not only can we work out how we want our own minds to work, how to drive our own minds, but we want to work out how we're going to drive our cultures. How are we going to create a culture in the future, in the next 100, 200 years, which we would love our grandchildren to work in? Because at the moment, if we don't do anything, we're heading for a Blade Runner world where the rich are getting richer and more of us will get poorer and we will be left to our crimes and so on and so on. So let me take you through very quickly. This is the importance of caring behavior. Okay, so the caring behavior is one of the most fundamental, one of the most important evolutionary changes in the universe. To care for another, in this case your own infant, is one of the most important evolutionary changes and we take it for granted. You can get it wrong sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, I'll go through this quickly. So caring then is partly what inspires us and gives us positive. When we care, when we see care and love in the face of another, this stimulates a lot of positive emotions within us. And we know that a lot of the people who sadly suffer from depression don't necessarily get much of this positive activation. We also know that caring has a soothing quality. So it can be activating, exciting to be with people you care about and love. It also has a soothing quality. And we know that we have three types of emotion. Those are emotions which are there to help us defend ourselves. And those are the emotions that take preference. They are the first line of emotions. Then we have emotions which are there to activate us, their excitement, to achieve things, we do things. But there are also emotions which are there to calm us down. So if you imagine then, if you're distressed by something and somebody is critical of you, that's not going to be very helpful. It's just going to make you feel more threatened. Or if somebody is kind to you, that will calm you down. So we know all this stuff, right? Now, the, the, the reason why this is important is because the physiology is important. Because we know that when people are, create supportive relationships with each other, they do a number of things. Firstly, 
the individual wants to turn towards that person, they'll seek them out. You seek out people that will be helpful. That individual creates what is called a secure base. This is particularly true for parent-child, where the child feels confident to go out and try things. But importantly, too, it creates what is called a safe haven. That is, when you turn to that other person, that other person has the capacity to calm you down. So I want to show you this is quite nice. This is, this is showing you a secure base. It's gone a bit dizzy. Oops, um, sorry. Did you notice? Oops, sorry. Did you notice how the mother was constantly looking? So immediately the child goes back to the secure base. That's how it works, right? When we're threatened, we seek out. Now, many of our clients don't know how to do that. So that system operates to regulate threat. When we are able to soothe ourselves and tap into that system, we don't regulate our threat, and we can also encourage ourselves. So in the last few minutes, just tell you a couple of things. So your autonomic nervous system has two branches to it. One which is activating, and that's important, but another branch which is deactivating. So your parasympathetic system is constantly uh, functioning to slow you down. So without a parasympathetic system, your heart rate would be around 120 beats a minute. But with it, your heart rate is between 60 and 80, resting heart rate. Your, your vagal nerve is the most important nerve in your body for helping you to calm down, right? And there's a whole load of reasons why that is true. I won't go into it too much. But what we know is that when you have good vagal tone, you've got good vagus, this vagus, this parasympathetic system is working. This is related to calm states. Uh, you experience more positive states. You have lower blood pressure. Um, it responds to breathing, so we do a lot of breathing exercises in developing this because what we find is that many of our clients, bless their hearts, their uh, vagus nerve doesn't work terribly well. They're not able to soothe, they're not able to calm, and in people like uh, certain people in the, in the States, if you measured their heart rate, it'd be sympathetic, high sympathetic arousal. Mindfulness, practicing mindfulness, time out. Okay, so... Um, just one last thing to say to you. So basically, if you create a compassionate mind in your mind, if you create a sense of a compassionate self, and do come on to some of our trainings because we'll teach you how to do that, which is the self you want to be, practicing the self you want to be, doing the breathing exercising, doing the posture exercises, you will be bringing online these physiological systems. And when you do that, you'll be able to help regulate your threat. And when you do that, your frontal cortex opens up. So rather than just having a critical mind, you'll be able to um, have this kind of mind. So my time is up. But if you want to read more about it, not that I'm advertising myself or anything so crude as that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much.